for joining Building an Exclusive Workforce When Diversity Looks Different, presented by Partners in Employment. Northeast Delta Human Services Authority is led by Dr. Montez A. Sizer, Executive Director. Collectively, we are all directed by our vision, mission, and tenants. Our vision, to build a unified Northeast Louisiana where individuals are thriving and reaching their full human potential. Our mission, to serve as a catalyst for individuals with mental health, developmental disabilities, and addictive disorders. And our tenants that guide our actions. Greater access to services, excellent customer service, quality competent care. Again, welcome to Building an Exclusive Workforce When Diversity Looks Different, presented by Partners in Employment. Now you will hear from Joanne Haynes Powell, a member of the Northeast Delta HSA's Developmental Disabilities Team. I want to begin this afternoon by sharing with you the why behind PI. In late 2016 and early 2017, our agency, Northeast Delta HSA, was wrapping up listening sessions around Northeast Louisiana with the people who receive services through the developmental disability section of our office. In these, sec in these sessions, we heard a lot of discussion and questions about employment opportunities or rather a lack of those opportunities for many of the people we support with developmental disabilities. In our conversations, we heard and acknowledged that there were existing agencies that addressed employment, but that there was more work to be done. Waits were long, opportunities were scarce. The people we spoke to in our communities were asking for more when the supports needed for employment were above and beyond what many of the established programs were focused on or equipped for. These conversations are how Partners in Employment, or PI, came to be. We at Northeast Delta HSA know that wellness is a multifaceted, that wellness is multifaceted, and that a holistic approach that includes occupational wellness is not only consistent with our commitment to deliver programs and services that encourage people to reach their true human potential, but it's essential to improving the quality of life of the people that we serve. Today, PI is a partnership that brings together the developmental disabilities knowledge and funding of Northeast Delta HSA with the employment expertise of Goodwill Industries of North Louisiana to address the employment needs of our community. PI is an employment-based program aimed at addressing the lack of opportunities for people with developmental disabilities to secure competitive community-based employment. PI supports individuals with developmental disabilities with job training, placement, and on-the-job support for job coaching. PI utilizes a person-centered approach to meet individual needs, wants, desires, and goals to ensure positive programmatic outcomes and increased participation levels. All of that sounds super fancy, but it's actually very simple. People with developmental disabilities tell us they want to work, and then we get to work. Through the partnership with Goodwill, PI helps these people get real jobs in the community and make sure that they have the support they need to stay in those jobs. PI was created so that everyone who is willing to work can. In addition to job training, placement, and support, PI is working to raise awareness and build community capacity through events like this one. Today, you're gonna to hear from two leaders in the area of disability employment. We'll talk about building an inclusive workforce, barriers and benefits of diversity, and how we can all work together to create opportunities for everyone. You will also hear from just a few of the job seekers currently enrolled in the PI program and looking for jobs. You'll hear one success, one of many success stories from PI, someone who lost his job this past year during the pandemic, but because of PI has been able to begin a new job and a new journey. We want you to know that we wanna hear from you so today we'll take questions at the end of the session. Please take notes as we go along or place your questions in the chat box so that we can discuss them at the end. Also feel free to email us after the webinar at pi at, northe at nedeltahsa.org. That's P-I-E at nedeltahsa.org. As our executive director has said, we believe in what is possible. Our employment initiative is, keeping, is in keeping with our agency's problem-solving disposition. PI is a huge step in the right direction and it couldn't have come at a better time. 
With that thought in mind, I would like you to introduce a friend of mine, Alan. Oh, my. Name is Alan. I already started working ever about 10 years. Now I start a new job tomorrow at Butcher's. I tomorrow I start back in the groceries, sit back and start stacking some stuff, watching TV, playing video games. Um, I went to school, watch it all. I, I, I graduate from watch it all. I start tomorrow and I sign some uh, paperwork just to start working tomorrow. And what did you do when you were at Avalon for 10 years working? Uh, uh, oh yeah, uh, I was talking about something. Mm hmm I saw him. Yeah, I watched the, uh, I watched the video with the, uh, uh, get, the, uh, get jobs. So did the interview skills video help you on your interview with Brookshire's? Mm hmm Do you feel like it, it helped you do better on your interview at Brookshire's? Mm hmm okay. Hi, I'm Jamie Donaldson with Goodwill a state leader in disability issues for over a decade, <clears throat> Bambi Paula Zola has worked with people with disabilities and their families as an educator and as a home and community-based service provider. She serves on the Louisiana Developmental Disabilities Council, Statewide Interagency Coordinating Council for Early Steps, State Independent Living Council, College and Career Readiness Commission state as a model employer task force, as well as on the boards of numerous disability related nonprofit organizations. As a mother of a young man with a disability, Bambi understands the needs of families and is respected for her knowledge and advocacy on their behalf. Her work has primarily been centered in capacity building and is systemic change that supports people with disabilities and their families to be fully included and valued members of their communities. Bambi currently serves in the administration of Louisiana Governor John Bell Edwards as Executive Director of the Governor's Office of Disabilities Affairs. Please welcome Bambi. Hi everyone, thank you for having me here today. It's great that I'm able to be with um, all of you um, from North Louisiana, I'm down here in, in Baton Rouge where the weather is um, really yucky and it'll probably be like that for several days, um, but just really glad that we have technology that can connect, uh, connect me to you today. Um, I'm gonna first start off telling you a little bit about our office and some of the councils within our office, and then I'll move into um, talking to you a little bit about our work with employment and um, I have with me one of my colleagues, Lillian Dejean, um, who works within the Governor's Office of Disability Affairs. And um, she will also share with you um, um, a little bit later in the presentation. Um, and so basically there's two um, premise to the, the Governor's Office of Disability Affairs. And, and it's established by the Governor's Office to adequately um, educate, address, and resolve issues and concerns related to the disability community. And so if you think about the disability community, the umbrella is really large and it is disability across the lifespan. And so anything related to people with disabilities and how their lives are affected, it falls under um, our umbrella uh, to draw, try to address with policy, with state agencies and working with community organizations. Um, and our mission um, is really to, to promote and encourage and support citizens with disabilities um, in all aspects of their life um, and also their families and communities because we we know we're all interconnected. Next slide. Okay. 
Um, just a few of our programs and initiatives that um, you may have heard of. Um, the Governor's Office of Disability Affairs Co Conference, it's held every year in July, the anniversary of um, the signing of the ADA. Um, this past year, um, we um, expanded it to be a two-day conference, but because of COVID, it was virtual. Um, which actually turned out to be really great. Typically, we have about 300 people attend that conference when we have it in person, but um, in 2020, we had 600 people attend the conference virtually. Um, so it's really a great conference, covers a, a lot of different topics. So I encourage you all to, to try to attend uh, this year, we plan on having it um, kind of a hybrid. We're not sure how it's going to work in person and um, and virtual options. We also have the Gold Awards, um, which is a great um, program that we have every year um, that re just recognizes about 14 to 16 people across the state in different categories who really have done ex um, really great work in uh, disabilities. At the same time, we have an inclusive art contest, which is open to people across the uh, lifespan and really with a theme about inclusion. Um, and so that's really great to see all of the, um, the artistic abilities that our citizens have. We also have, um, I'll go to the bottom, our monthly newsletter. If you haven't signed up for our um, monthly newsletter, you can go to our website and sign up for that. Um, and we try and include as much information from around the state related to, um, though it's important to the disability community. Um, we, of course, have constituent services within our office, so we try to meet people's needs, um, try to give community briefings on what's going on, especially in times like now, which we just started the legislative session yesterday, so there's a lot of information that people need to know about what's going on in the legislative process, so we try to keep people aware. Um, and we also have disability uh, awareness events throughout the year. You can go to the next slide. And this is our website. Um, and like I said, you can, you can click on there. There's a lot of different resources and information and you can sign up for our newsletter at our website. Within um, GOTA, which is the Governor's Office of Disability Affairs, we have four councils that we oversee. Um, first is the Governor's Advisory Council on Disability Affairs, um, the State Interagency Coordinating Council for Early Steps, the Statewide Independent Living Council, and State as a Model Employer Task Force. In the next slides, I'll explain each of those councils. Go to the next slide. Okay, so the duties of the um, the Governor's Advisory Council on Disability Affair, or GACTA is what it's commonly called, is really just to advise the governor and other stakeholders on issues related to people with disabilities, um, and then just assist our office with kind of resolutions of state disability issues. Um, and so um, the next slide, um, within GACTA, we have several uh, committees education, housing, transportation, accessibility, and legislative. And so um, GACTA is made up of 31 members. Um, all of them are um, at large, except we have a senator and a representative. Um, and we try to have a diverse group of people representing uh, of all of the people across our state and in different areas of our state, different disabilities. And these committees really do the work of addressing these issues. They do kind of the day-to-day -day work. No one is compensated for this work. Everything is volunteer. And, and it's really great um, to see the, the commitment of our disability community in trying to address the, the issues that face um, people with disabilities in our state. Next slide. Um, other council is um, the council that uh, advises on early steps. Um, early steps is the program that uh, provides uh, intensive services for our babies, uh, zero to three, that have developmental delays. And, um, and so this council helps to um, just advise the program, program um, through, that is administered through our Louisiana Department of Health. Next slide. Um, 
the statewide independent living council is the council that um, advises um, how um, we fund our independent living centers and the type of services that um, our independent living centers provide. Um, you can see at the bottom of this slide, we have independent living centers in uh, eight locations across the state. Um, and, and those independent living centers um, just, they provide resources so that people with disabilities can live um, independently. Uh, more independently. Um, if you have not um, reached out to the independent living center in your area, I encourage you to do so. They have a wide variety of different programs and services that they provide. Um, and it's just a, a great resource that we have in our state. Next slide. Our state is a model employer task force. Um, is a task force that was actually created um, in, in 2018. The work began in 2016 when Governor Edwards took office. Um, and we have really been work focusing on employment um, since he began uh, his term as governor, um, employment for people with disabilities. And um, this, in 2018, our work had brought us to the point of uh, the governor um, issuing an executive order um, state as a model employer is kind of a national initiative, but basically um, it, it tries to um, improve our employment opportunities for people with disabilities and um, through, you know, um, recruitment, retention, uh, training, um, so that there's more opportunities um, for people with disabilities in our workforce. And um, I'll go into a little bit more about, um, about that. Uh, this will kind of be what I'll focus on for um, the, the remainder of, of the presentation. Uh, so, so basically the way that this, this works is every um, state agency that's under the direction of the governor, which is the majority of our state agencies is required to have a point person or an, an agency designee. It's typically the human resource um, officer for that state agency. And they, this, each state agency has to have a, an annual plan on how they are going to meet certain objectives in employment for people with disabilities. Um, some of those components um, include how are they going to train their managers um, in, in understanding disabilities for accommodations and recruitment and hiring, um, and as well as um, another component of it is a survey that we um, send out annually to all state um, employees asking for um, self-identification of uh, was anonymous, but to identify their disability, the type of disability so that we can keep some type of data to see if we're improving the percentages of people we're hiring in the state that have disabilities. Because as you know, of course, people do not have to, um, to tell their employer that they have a disability. So that this is a, this is a method in which people can anonymously share this information um, and we could um, compile that data and be able to um, kind of get an idea of what's going on in our state agencies. Um, another component um, is the Louisiana um, Rehabilitation Services has a point person. And so both um, the state agency has a point person in human resources and um, Louisiana Rehab Services has a point person. And so they're able to work together. So if there is a vocational rehabilitation client who's interested in a job at a particular state agency, they're able to communicate about um, that client and see if it's a good fit for that um, vocational rehabilitation client to perhaps be interviewed for the particular job that they're interested in. So it just helps to a little more of a person-centered approach in um, providing opportunities for state employment um, for people with disabilities. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pause because I feel like my I've been y'all been hearing my voice um, over and over um, for for too long now. But I'm going to ask um, my colleague Lillian Dejon. Um, Lillian um, works in our office, and she is an incredible um, person. 
um, does great work and um, asked her to come in and just kind of share a little bit about um, diversity um, and, and just um, really whatever she wants to share because whatever it is, it's gonna be great and insightful and I know you will enjoy it. So Lillian? Hi everyone, it's hard to follow up with such an intro, huh? Um, thank you for the, the kind intro. So hi, my name is Lillian Dejean. Like Ms. Fami mentioned, I, I work in the Governor's Office of Disability Affairs. And I kind of want to talk about diversity and inclusion specifically in the workplace today. And we talk a lot about inclusion and the importance of inclusion, but we never really talk about how we get there and what that process looks like, because it's not necessarily a set end goal, right? It's not necessarily, oh, we put a, a wheelchair ramp to the building and suddenly we're fully inclusive. It's an ever evolving process. We're learning all the time. I'm learning all the time about disability as a person with a disability. And so what I found from my personal experience as a person with a disability, working in the disability fields for over five years now, is that normalizing disability is absolutely the key. Frequently, I've found that other people are more uncomfortable with my disability than I am. But I think that's because the general assumption is that disability equals suffering, right? That your quality of life as an individual with a disability may be less than than your able-bodied peers. Um, for example, I went on a college campus tour about two years ago and I was using my wheelchair that day and we were on a slope and my muscles are particularly weak. And because of this, I um, drove my wheelchair straight into a bush. And it was, you know, very embarrassing. And I was on a tour with predominantly uh, non-disabled peers and everyone was completely horrified. Like, everyone was frozen because they were so horrified and this lasted for a good 10 seconds before anyone even breathed or moved. But in actuality, it was really just the equivalent of someone tripping on a curb, right? It, it wasn't really that big of a deal. I just ran into a bush, kind of a funny, embarrassing movement. But we really could have just, someone could have said, hey, you need some help? I say no, and we just move on. And we see this, this bias and these assumptions that disability equals suffering, even in academic studies. So recently, there was a Harvard study that came out that polled physicians from across the US. And about three out of four physicians that they polled said that they believed that people with disabilities had a poorer quality of life than non-disabled uh, people. And so this is just untrue. And it contributes to a lot of stigma and a lot of incorrect assumptions. And so I guess the question now is, how do, how do we break that stigma? How, how do we overcome these barriers to, an, to true inclusion? And that's when normalizing disability comes in. But normalizing disability comes from a fundamental understanding that disability is natural. It's not an anomaly. It's not particularly unusual. We're in a time that's starting to recognize how diverse the human race actually is. Yet we still view disability as a, de a deficit rather than just a testament to human diversity. Disability isn't necessarily a good or a bad thing. It just is. And so we, I, I've noticed that we often avoid using the word, you know, disabled or, or calling someone disabled will say like differently abled or they have special abilities, but really, disability isn't a bad thing. We don't have to tiptoe around it because it just is. It's natural, it's normal, it's a part of diversity. And tiptoeing around diverse, di diversity doesn't lead to the conversations about diversity that illuminates what actually is. It doesn't lead to that communication and normalization of disability. And by assuming that disability is a bad thing, it leads to a lot of assumptions about what living a disabled life might look like it leads to a lot of assumptions about quality of life and ability. Um, and so it's really interesting because whenever we look at history, pre even 1600s, whenever we look at indigenous cultures, they didn't have a word for disability, but rather the focus was on what the individual's talent was on. So maybe so-and-so may not be able to walk, but they're the best storyteller in our community. And this is so relevant to even employment today, truly customizing employment to ability, 
but also recognizing disability in that by accommodating them, recognizing it, but normalizing it and customizing employment. So there's a couple things that you may encounter with employing people with disabilities. You may encounter equipment that you've never seen before, wheelchairs, canes, ventilators, things that you may not see in your everyday trip to the grocery store, right? But it's important to keep in mind that equipment is simply a physical extension of the individual. It's really not necessarily a visual signal of disability, but rather just an extension of the person's body. So I use a ventilator every now and then. It goes on a cannula underneath my nose. It's a, it's a pretty hefty machine. Um, and a lot of people will try to carry it for me. It's like, I appreciate the concern. And I appreciate the accommodation. However, it's my lungs. And it's the same for people in wheelchairs. A lot of people with wheelchairs don't want other people pushing their wheelchairs without their permission because it's the equivalent of walking up to an able-bodied person picking them up and carrying them somewhere without letting them know anything. And as you can imagine, that can be very alarming. You may encounter individuals with invisible disabilities where you can't see their disabilities, but it's still there. Um, and employment doesn't necessarily have to be eight to five, five days a week. It can be more flexible than that. And we also know through the COVID-19 pandemic that work can be way more fluid than we originally thought virtual works too. And you don't necessarily have to have set work hours to be productive. It can be customized to the situation. And so employing people with disabilities may lead to a lot of innovation and creativity and a lot of new ideas, both from the employer, but also the employee. Because living with a disability in an inaccessible world that's a bit of a challenge and you have to figure a lot of things out a lot of the time and generally it's on the fly. So you have to figure things out really quickly too. And so by collaborating between the employee and the employer, you lead to some really amazing products, some really amazing accommodations and some really incredible ideas. So by employing a person with a disability, you may be bringing whole new concepts to the table that you've never considered before. And that's really pretty amazing. But that communication and that trust has to be there. That normalization of disability where, you know, you recognize disability as a part of an individual, but not as the whole individual. The communication, trust, and normalization is definitely key. And I think it's really neat too, because disability isn't necessarily always a physical condition either. The disability community has a really rich culture. We have a really rich history. And a lot of us have a lot of pride in being disabled because our history is so rich, our community is so beautiful. And there's no reason not to be proud of that. I mean, for instance, the ADA was stalled in Congress for two years. And so people with disabilities got a little bit upset about that. So they went up to the Capitol, threw themselves out of their wheelchairs and started like crawling up the steps to the Capitol. It was called the Capitol Crawl. The Capitol crawl. And it was a metaphorical representation of living in an inaccessible world. We have an amazing history and an amazing culture and an amazing community, right? And so really by recognizing all of these different factors, you know, communication, that it can lead to innovation, the culture, the history, we can really start to normalize disability and bring these really cool people into our workplace. So that's what I have for you guys today. I hope it gave you some ideas. And if you have any questions, I'm always down to chat. Thanks, Lillian. I appreciate your insight and your passion for um, people with disabilities and disability culture. I'd just like to add a, a few other um, just thoughts and, and share with you guys a little bit um, about kind of like what are some next steps. I, I talked about our work with State as a Model Employer. And of course, um, I'm here in Baton Rouge today and in a lot of our state agencies here in Baton Rouge, but we have state agencies um, offices across the state. And so um, as you think about employment for people with disabilities, I encourage you to, to, to look at the model for state as a model employer and think about our state agencies or our um, local government agencies, you know, parish government or um, city government. 
and and consider perhaps if there there may be some good um, employment opportunities for people with disabilities in those environments. Oftentimes, you have um, that there may be elected officials offices or um, other type of, of governmental offices, and those people are, are um, looking for opportunities to be able to um, support everyone in the community. So um, we, we've seen some really great um, ideas and, and employment opportunities come from those local um, governments. Also, um, and, and I know that there's not at the current time any opportunities that I'm aware of in post-secondary um, in North Louisiana, I, I know Bossier Parish Community College, I'm not sure if they still have the program, but for people who have intellectual and developmental disabilities, but um, we, we really are working to try and grow and have um, more of our um, post-secondary institutions, our universities and um, community colleges have those type of programs across the state. Um, and, and so we have, I know in South Louisiana, we have um, uh, Nichols, uh, University of Louisiana, um, Southeastern, all have two and four year programs for people with um, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, Baton Rouge Community College also has a program. Um, uh, LSU in Alexandria it should be starting a program in the fall. And um, I heard that I think Grambling is looking into starting a program as well. Um, I would love to see all of our post-secondary um, institutions have those opportunities for our people with disabilities um, with a focus, of course, always with um, having an employment goal at the end. Um, we, um, and through, through that, another component of that would be um, to engage with our um, pre-employment transi transition services through LRS. Um, LRS is, is working to try and make um, those opportunities connecting with our school systems to provide these pre-employment transition services to our people ages um, 16, 21 or 22. Um, and, and, and so they making those connections with our, our high schools, um, our local school systems, um, and also with employers in the community that are that are willing to um, uh, be employers through the um, pre-employment transition services of which LRS will pay for all of the salary um, um, or wages for students up to a certain uh, number of hours. And so I just wanted to throw those things out um, as just some ideas and I will be glad to um, you know, answer any questions or you can always email me. Um, I think my information is provided and we will um, try and help out however we can um, in getting more people employed and active and um, in full membership and participation in our communities across the state. Tell us your name. Me and How old are you? 25. What are your hobbies? Running. And painting. Running and painting. And what, what is your dream job? I'm a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. And what else do you want to tell us about yourself? I'm nice. You're nice? And what school did you go to in? I heard that high school. Watch high school? Yeah. And what year did you graduate? 2001. 2001? And what did you do at school? What did you participate in at school? I don't want to cheerlead it off for my friends. You were cheerleading? Yeah. And have you? They picked me up. They picked you up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And have you ever um, done any work before? No. Have you ever volunteered to do any work? No. Okay. So you're you're um, hoping that Goodwill can help you find a job, right? Yeah, ma'am. And before you become a lawyer, what else would you like to do? What other kind of jobs would you like to do? I'm going to do puppies. You want to work with puppies? Yeah. So maybe pet smart? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Bambi and Lillian. We really appreciate um, 
what you have brought to us today. Now I will be introducing Ms. Stephanie Benedetti. Stephanie is the Senior Vice President of External Affairs at Lighthouse Louisiana and a passionate advocate for the employment of people with disabilities. Stephanie has spent the last 15 years of her career creating opportunities for employers to connect with people with disabilities. In her tenure at the Lighthouse, Stephanie has managed teams of talented certified employment specialists, spearheaded internal programming, creating upward mobility paths for people with disabilities and expanded programming, including federal, federally supported employment rehabilitation and disability benefit support. When not advocating for inclusive workplaces, Stephanie can be found hiking, biking, cooking, or reading with her four-year-old daughter, Ella, and her husband, Rob. Welcome Bambi, or Miss Stephanie, sorry about that. That's okay, Jamie. Hi, everyone. Um, again, I'm Stephanie. That was a great bio. I think um, that kind of covers that. But just to tell you all a little bit about Lighthouse Louisiana, we're a 105-year-old organization, and we are located in three locations primarily, so New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and then also Gulf, Gulfport, Mississippi, but we cover really wide swaths of the state and have provided supportive services of all types for people all across. So we have three main parts of our mission, services, employment, and advocacy. And so for services, we do a lot of things and we would spend the next 40 minutes of me telling you about all the different services we provide for people with disabilities and with people with disabilities, but I just wanted to focus really quick on some of the em employment work we do. First of all, we are a model for the capabilities of people with disabilities across the state. We employ people at all levels um, in our organization with disabilities from our executive team all the way to entry level positions and every um, position type in between. And we have people in manufacturing jobs, customer service roles, management jobs, retail, all, all kinds of um, different job types for people and really show um, the community that people with disabilities can do all things. We also do um, a couple different programs like Goodwill. We're a vendor with the state to do employment services. We also are a vendor with the Federal Ticket to Work program where we do employment services. And then we also um, do some benefits counseling and other supportive things around people with disabilities. And then we also do the advocacy piece, which is really important and go out and talk all the time to employers and the community about the importance of hiring people with disabilities, how to hire people with disabilities, and um, building those inclusive communities and in their workplace, as well as in their community itself. So today we're gonna focus on the benefit piece of hiring people with disabilities. But before we go too deep into that, I'm gonna to go to the next slide and just um, talk a little bit about who are people with disabilities. So next slide, thank you. So I think Lillian uh, in her remarks really kind of hit it over the head that disability is not an anomaly. One in five, 64 million people have a disability uh, of US adults. That's a lot of people. Um, and then 22 million of those are in prime working age or 35% of those are in the 16 to 64 category. So you've got this huge population of people and right in front of you, they're the largest minority group and they're kind of all around us. So like Lillian said, you can't really tell who has a disability by looking and never, you can never make an assumption because while some disabilities, yes, like a wheelchair, you might make an, you know, can make some assumptions about that disability that they might have one, or if someone is blind and using a white cane, you, you don't really know. And you also don't know their accommodations that they need, um, how that disability fits into their abilities and all these other questions. So you really can't make assumptions. Despite the fact that people with disabilities are all around us, the national unemployment rate is twice that um, than the broader population. So there's definitely this difference between um, how the workforce has taken in people with disabilities. So I wanna talk about some of the myths uh, first before we talk into some of the value proposition pieces about people with disabilities. So if we'll go to the next slide, I'm gonna talk about some of those myths or misconceptions. 
So these, there are so many myths about people with disabilities and I have heard them all in the time. I've just chosen some of the top ones I hear for this slide, um, but I hear all sorts of things. And I'm gonna later talk through some of the value propositions and show you guys some information and data to help you understand why these are myths and misconceptions and not truths. So the first thing um, is that people with disabilities are less productive than non-disabled people, that you'll get a lower work product or a lesser work product universally. Another myth is that um, there's higher turnover. People with disabilities are more likely to leave and you won't have that consistent workforce. Another myth is that they're sick more often, right? They have a disability, so they're gonna have lots of unscheduled leave and scheduled leave and need to be out sick all the time um, and won't be able to be there when you need them. Another misconception is that it's hurtful to a company's image or how they want to brand or market themselves, that having someone with a disability um, just doesn't, doesn't look good in how they want it to go out there in the world. And another is they're not as qualified. They don't have their credentialing or the experience or et cetera as people with disabilities. There are so many other ones. I hear costs to accommodate all the time. Like I can't possibly, I'm a small business owner. I can't possibly afford to hire someone with a disability. Um, oh, I, it's, it's unsafe. I can't bring someone in with a disability into our workspace because it'll be unsafe for their coworkers and for um, you know, their, their physical being. And they'll come into my manufacturing facility and they'll be unable to work here and we'll have really high workers' compensation claims. Hear all these things all the time. Well, don't worry, I'm going to tell you the facts and how research and studies show that all of these myths are in fact myths. And in many cases, the actual there's benefits of hiring people with disabilities to actually do things like increase your safety, increase your productivity and benefit your company's image. So that is really the message I like to tell that all these myths totally fake. Who knows where they came from, but they still exist. We hear time and time again from employers antidotally in the community, but also studies show that hiring managers still have these misconceptions in their minds when they're making those hiring decisions and when they're thinking about the inclusivity of, of bringing people on, how that will impact their job, their workspace, um, and their things like their productivity. All right, so let's go to the next slide and we're just going to dive in. All right, so before I jump into these, I do want to say organizations like Lighthouse Louisiana and like Goodwill are here for you to help you understand and work specifically to create job matches for the client. Because just like any employee without a, employee without a disability you may be hiring, you have to find that right match, right? And there are expert job coaches at Lighthouse, at Goodwill, and other vendors across the state whose whole job is to try to make that match. And it's not just about putting any employee with a disability in any job. It's about finding that great fit. And we can help you as kind of experts in understanding and working with accommodations and with people with disabilities about how to create that perfect match. And so that you've got the right job carved out for the right person and that that person's gonna excel and thrive and meet all these wonderful value propositions I'm about to dive into with you. All right, so that's first, job, job match, so important. But once you've found that job match, what are the value propositions? So the first one, man, hiring pool. I went ahead and shared with you about that one in five so you are opening up your hiring pool, you know, 20% bigger. <laughs> You're making that bigger, that one in five, um, just by opening up and being inclusive in your hiring. So how do you do that? Well, I mentioned connecting with organizations like Lighthouse and like Goodwill, who literally have wait lists of clients looking for jobs right now who are waiting for you to work with them and to help find these great job matches. I know we have folks come to us who say, you know, I'm looking for this specific skill set. And I often can find someone on our caseload who meets some areas of that skill set. It's actually been really exciting to see those partnerships happen. And so I am sure that Goodwill and some of the other vendors have similar caseload types who they're ready to match now with a job opening you may have. So with that, um, there's also other partners in your community, including the American Job Center, the Centers for Independent Living. Um, and then there's also, you know, university 
special education departments have some hiring support. Um, and so there's just lots of places out there where you can tap into expertise and resources to help connect you to, with people with disabilities. There's also the Job Accommodation Network, the Government Department of Labor has lots of resources for you on how to increase that hiring pool. And there's some really simple things you can do. Go look at your job descriptions. Are there inclusive language in your job description that clearly show that you have an inclusive culture and that you are willing to accommodate and work with people who might need some accommodations in the workplace? So putting that right out there in the job description that you have this inclusive culture and that you have inclusive language really already opens up that hiring pool for you. And we find that it not just attracts people with disabilities to your culture and to your organization, but also attracts people without disabilities who are looking for that cultural fit that is open and understands the importance of inclusion and diversity. So you're not just expanding that hiring pool that way, you're also bringing in a large hiring of, of people who are looking for um, cultures that are inclusive. The next one is um, we hear that sometimes people think people are more expensive to hire if they have a disability. They're not. Um, no more expensive to hire. And accommodation costs average only $313. And often there's state and federal resources you can pull to cover those accommodation costs. So again, on average $313, more than half of people um, who ask for accommodations on the workplace ask for zero cost accommodations. Just to give some examples of a zero cost accommodation, we had a client who came to us and they wanted to be a janitor and they um, could not read and, had, and were nonverbal. So we thought, great, we, we, we're going to find a way to make this work. So we found a great um, employer who was looking for someone to do cleaning of their building at night. And their practice had been that they would make a list of all the things and they would check off the list, right? Well, this person was nonverbal and couldn't read. And so a list of written instructions wasn't going to work. So all we did, zero cost, was go on the internet. <laughs> I'm someone. Can we mute um, LW? Yeah, I like the blue Can someone mute them? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so let me backtrack here. Okay. So all we did was make picture cards. Very simple. Went on the internet, found some pictures of someone vacuuming, of someone mopping, of someone sweeping. Uh, you know, all the tasks, toilet cleaning, et cetera, and put them on little cards. And we made a Velcro board that would go in the cleaning closet. And when the person would arrive for the day, the manager, instead of making the list, had just put up the cards that they needed done that day and Velcroed them up. As they completed the tasks, they pulled them and put them into a box so the manager knew what they completed. And it was a way for them to have easy, easy communication and to kind of build that um, channel for them at no cost. So it was, it was very simple. And there are so many examples of low cost, no cost accommodations or small cost accommodations that can be done of people with all sorts of disabilities. Um, some of them, I know Lillian mentioned like how the flexible of where you work and how you work and the time you work could be some of those accommodations, which again, doesn't cost anything or it costs very little. Um, but then, then allows that employee with a disability to be able to work and work for you at most effectively. And that's important too. All right. Um, beyond that, we have enhanced staff morale. So um, there is a correlation that they keep showing. And when they're doing these big studies of companies that have focused on inclusive hiring and disability hiring of profit, morale, and engagement, and they are super interconnected. Today's workforce, and I consider myself an old millennial, but I know we're part of that group. Millennials and younger want to work for a purpose. Studies keep showing that, that there is some purpose work being done and that they are drawn to working with a purpose. So to recruit from this talent pool that's becoming your middle-aged uh, and you know management and director level workers, having that for a purpose as part of who you are and what you do is super attractive. 
So enhancing staff morale by building this culture that is open and inclusive and listens and has a mission to support people with disabilities beyond maybe a mission of profit um, is, is really powerful. And we'll talk a little bit later, but also studies are showing that that increases things like loyalty, not just of employees with disabilities, but employees without disabilities as well. And so kind of creating this culture around acceptance and teams and building is all related to setting these kind of submissions of your profit side of your organization, but also building that morale within that this is company goals that we work towards these really large, exciting things. So again, I shared a myth that people with disabilities are more likely um, to have work-related accidents. Not true, <laughs> just not true. Um, I actually will give an antidotal story. Lighthouse has three manufacturing locations. Um, I mentioned Baton Rouge, New Orleans, and Gulfport, where people who are blind are working on um, high-speed manufacturing equipment. And we had one workplace accident in the last 365 days of an employee who was cited with a trip hazard. We do not see any increases in workplace safety and larger statistics show that as well, that actually um, people with disabilities in workplace, there's no correlation between safety and accidents and actually a slight decrease in, in um, accidents and safety related incidences of people with disabilities in the workplace. Lots of research on why that may be. I think it's just a fresh look on safety, right? We have um, safety committees at each of our locations and our employees with disabilities sit on those committees and help us all see an alternative perspective on their environments that they're working in and what could potentially be unsafe or, or safe or could enhance safety. And so having that diverse group all sitting down and talking through makes us stronger because we have really fresh perspectives and ideas around what could bring us to safety and to be safer in our facilities. So that is definitely something that just, there's a real value there to your company to have that lower or same work-related accidents and to not have that fear that if you hire someone with a disability, that'll increase. It's not true. Um, there's also, I mentioned the attendance thing. Um, studies show same or better. So same or better attendance. There's a premier employer that you might have heard of, Walgreens, who has done so much, re so much research on when they did a transformation of their hiring force from being a, um, a workforce primarily of people without disabilities to having of their distribution center employees, over 50% of them have a disability. Beside their 120% productivity increase, their they saw massive declines in absenteeism and studies time and time again say that people with disabilities do not have any higher rates of absenteeism and actually have um, less rates of unscheduled absenteeism because sometimes there are some medical leave and other appointments centered around your disability and you often are used to scheduling and working through those because of your history of dealing with um, the medical interventions or other things you might need to accommodate your disability or to serve your disability. So it's really interesting that the data shows that people with disabilities um, have same or better attendance um, as their coworkers and especially with that unscheduled piece better. So you hear the old mantra, right? It's cheaper to retain an employee than it is to hire a new one. We've heard that just time and time again. And um, there is a reduction statistically in employee turnover, not just of employees with disabilities, but also employees without disabilities. Companies that focus on diversity hiring see lower turnover. The loyalty is to the company and to the positive connection to the business practice. So that goes back to that morale, right? Like really just being connected as an overall culture and mission to what you're doing. So there is just not true that there's high turnover with people with disabilities. CVS, which we've all heard of, <laughs> CV, I'm sure CVS is a massive pharmacy chain. Um, they reported their retention was doubled when they increased um, their hiring with people with disabilities. So we're, we, statistically know that as well, but also I can tell you at the Lighthouse, we see that as well, is that we, um, and we actually 
ask our employees annually, can we help you find a job somewhere else? Because we um, wanna make sure people with disabilities always have choice and are given supports and resources to find jobs within the lighthouse or outside. So we provide a, a resource for our individual employees and um, almost 95% of our employees annually report that they would like to stay with us. They like the culture of inclusion and um, even with all the resources offered to them, they, they report they would like to stay and instead work on maybe upward mobility tracks or other things, but like that culture you create and we have very low turnover. So I can tell you that internally, anecdotally, but also uh, out, in the, out in the business world as well. All right, I mentioned that Walgreens 120% productivity. So that dedication and productivity piece is certainly there. Um, studies show that inclusive teams, teams that include people with disabilities had an average of 80% better productivity than non-inclusive teams. A study by DuPont um, said 90% employees with disabilities rated average or better compared with um, 95% without. So pretty even, like really no difference. And so what we really see is that um, the, the productivity is a myth that they have lower productivity, people with disabilities, it's the same or, or even better. So um, yeah, there's definitely the next one actually hadn't gotten there yet. So someone asked to repeat the explanation for reduced cost of employee benefits was just about to jump there. So we are there right now. There's a common misconception that people with disabilities will increase the cost of employee benefits. Uh, that if I bring on someone that my, you know, the unemployment I have to pay will be higher, that workers' compensation will be higher, that medical costs will be higher, just not the case. Um, it actually, in some cases, is flat or shows reductions, specifically hiring from pools of people that have alternative benefits um, already through other channels, that there is actually no, no evidence of increased costs, and in many cases, decreased costs of those employee benefits to someone with a disability. So that's kind of just a real, a real value proposition there, something you don't have to be um, fearful of. And actually, I'm going to get into just a moment, there's actually financial benefits for a company directly. And so even if you had potentially a small increase in some benefits cost, there's some tax credits and other things that can offset any of those. But again, statistically, there's not um, an increase in the cost of employee benefits and actually some small deductions specifically in specific pools, um, hiring pools of people. I thought Lillian did such a great job of talking about that DNI, the diversity and inclusion peace and the culture. I'm going to go into a whole bunch of other ideas around people with disabilities related to the marketplace. And uh, but just off the bat, people with disabilities represent $200 billion in discretionary spending. So already having that diverse seat next to you and someone with a different perspective and who could potentially open up your product or service to the community of people with disabilities by making it accessible and accommodating right off the bat, you're already opening up that whole market channel for yourself um, and, and really having that inclusive group that will bring your product to market. And we'll talk about some examples of that, but really um, that piece is not just trending. It's so important to what we're seeing that for effective marketplaces, Google calls it the science of inclusivity. And what they're talking about is actually engineering services and products that are accessible for people with disabilities to open up their market share to that group. So it's, it's actual businesses who are saying, whoa, this really works to open up our market for those for um, to include people with disabilities and be, be inclusive instead of exclusive. Um, one of the things I know we value at the Lighthouse and that we have seen time and time again is that the fresh perspective and problem solving piece, people with disabilities have thought of different ways in their lifetime to work through problems often and really bring a super fresh perspective, just like any type of diversity would have in your team from economic to racial, et cetera, the disability piece is there too, really bringing a different way to solve problems, diversifying your company's culture, innovating differently, helping you look at business problems from a different perspective. 
And it, when you have all these different voices at the table, you're more likely to present a product and service that's going to work better and be stronger because you have all these different people represented. And we find that true with people with disabilities, certainly at the Lighthouse, but also in our communities. So another one is increased customer market and revenue. Um, businesses who act actively seek to employ people with disabilities outperform businesses who do not with 28% higher revenues, two times the net income, more profit margin higher by 30%. And the DOL says people with disabilities um, also have that increased retention as well by up to 90%. So there's a recent DOL study on retention around hiring people with disabilities. So man, like right there, you've just got all this data to say like, no matter your business size, and this was done on small, medium and large businesses, there are real financial values from having people at the table with these diverse, um, diverse backgrounds, experiences and problem solving skills that can help your product or service. So um, one of the things that it's really interesting that you can think about is how can you incorporate people with disabilities and their unique perspectives into your marketing strategy, right? So at the table, creating that marketing plan and opening up and ensuring that your product and service will work for those people. I know at Lighthouse, because we have so many people who are blind working on our team and people who are deaf and hard of hearing, we look specifically for products and services that can meet our needs and demands of all of our employees. So I remember looking, we were looking for performance management software, right? And there are, man, hundreds of them, it seems, on the market. But we really were looking for one that was the most accessible. And that one won, like, hands down. There was all these other ones that had you know, different things and different products and that were equal or not equal. When we all came down to it, it was the one that was the most accommodating and open to people, people with disabilities that everyone could access. And we love our performance management system at the Lighthouse, so we made the right call. But definitely, I'm glad that whoever was creating that uh, was at the table considered inclusivity when creating their product. And when we go out in the market and look for those specific products, I know Lighthouse is what we're looking for. And I believe as we're seeing shifts in the market and companies continuing to embrace and want to have diverse groups, that they're going to be asking those same questions of their performance management software, of their services, of their speakers, of the platforms they use um, to have virtual events and in-person events. And I think we're just going to see more and more of that. And it's really interesting if you've got someone with a disability who's in not just your marketing, but also in your product or service development team who can think about those questions for you and help you create that market. It's really fascinating. Um, and same with testing market tactics. Like you're, again, that's, we're talking about a big piece, one in five of the population. And um, especially having people with different disabilities and different experiences all around you at the table who can give you some marketing tactics for, um, the disability community or for their group who can help that make sure your communication channels for advertising and for messaging is is inclusive. Um, I'm not going to call anyone out, but I recently went to a diversity and inclusive in, inclusion event um, that had not asked if anyone needed an accommodation before the event and someone who was deaf came and they didn't have um, they, it was a DNI event that was focused on racial justice and did not have a disability piece. And so it is interesting if they had had someone on their team who was thinking specifically about inclusion related to people with disabilities and might have said, hey, wait, we need to make sure we ask if accommodations are needed and how we can provide those accommodations. It's really interesting that um, how those messages really overlap. And then um, yeah, recognizing that disability is diverse. It does, it's not one size fits all and making sure you have as many voices around you that will give you that, make your event or your program or your service or your product just really shine. And um, that is just been, is so key in what we're seeing business practice do. 
to have um, the strongest product and service in the community. And then also we have found that devising, having people with disabilities around you to help you devise simple modifications to make existing products and services more accessible for um, them and their community group. We, we have a, a group who's constantly making um, suggestions to some of the common software platforms we use like our accounting software platform, et cetera. We're giving them information um, to make their product better. And if they had their those folks on their team helping them, it would be better from the start, right? And serve more people. And, and definitely having that uh, group there to help those technical people who are coding websites or doing what they're doing to have that advice to make it more accessible. It's just from the start would be even more appealing. There are some tax and financial incentives. Every, we have a the lighthouse, we give every employer small to large, a kind of listing of here are your benefits that you can get financially. Cause I understand you're a business, especially small businesses. Um, there are tax credits for hiring people with disabilities ranging from $1,200 to $9,600. There's some rules around it, but that's in general the range. There's also some disabled access uh, grants you can get and disabled access tax credits. You can get up to $15,000. Louisiana has some money. If you're working with vendors like Goodwill or like Lighthouse Louisiana, they can also work with you for some of the state and federal funds that people may be able to pull down who have disabilities to access some of their um, technology or other workplace accommodation needs. I know for people who are blind, who I work a lot with, um, they need often JAWS or screen reader software or um, Zoom text, which makes your text larger or changes colors to best work with your vision loss. Well, if we are partnered with the state or federal government for some of our employment programs, we can actually work with the employer and the employee, the new employee, to help get those accommodations because we want people with disabilities to be in that job match and not to have a barrier to their employment be because it's a financial burden or that the small business just doesn't have the funds. So having that partnership and really working together to bring that person and accommodate and train and work with a business partner is so important. So there's lots of opportunities out there for businesses to grab onto. One of the biggest ones also is government contracting. More and more government contracting rules and policies are coming down about having people with disabilities um, in the application process of um, and kind of expectations around hiring people with disabilities in performance of a contract. We at, at Lighthouse do have government contracts specifically around um, because of our hiring practices around people with disabilities. We're part of a federal program. We also have some independent contracts, some commercial kind of contracts that had some language around disability hiring and inclusion in them. And I believe that's going to continue to increase. We've just gradually seen it tick up over the years. And so really that as a business owner, you might really want to consider what future opportunities, both in the state and federal government, government level may be available to you as well um, as you've opened up and, and made your workplace one that is very inclusive and in, in, hiring specifically people with disabilities to also attract these additional revenue funds. So I put these at the end because there's so many wonderful values around hiring people with disabilities. But yes, there are these also kind of incentives that have been created by the federal government or the state um, as well to support a business owner in making this really cool choice about including people with disabilities in their practice and in their culture. All right, so that was a lot. So we can go to the next slide. Thank you. All right, so I did put my contact. You're free to connect with me and your experts really here are goodwill as well for the Northeast region, um, as well as with um, Bambi's office, as well as with Louisiana Rehab Services, as well as with your local job centers. But um, just in closing, so let's say you're all really jazzed. You're like, I want to create this inclusive work culture like right now um, at, your, at your workplace, which I really hope that's what everyone's feeling right now. Um, so a first step would be to turn to a community organization um, like Lighthouse or like Goodwill in your community. Find that community partner and have them help you. I know we talk to employers all the time about about these things in detail. We'll work hand in hand with an employer um, to, you know, for training of their employees, for training of their hiring managers, for engaging with their staff um, to really work on that mission for that employer. 
um, and kind of engage in disability education programs for everyone, um, as well as help you work on, if you would like, kind of conversations around organizational goals, organizational practice around um, disability inclusion. So definitely kind of, excuse me, definitely kind of thinking through and looking at those things as well. And then, yeah, that's it for me. I'm, well, I guess we're holding for questions. I was about to ask any questions, but I won't. Um, and so we'll ask this later, but thanks for all your time and for listening. And um, yeah, I hope, I hope everyone here is, is off to go hire more people with disabilities and to really create inclusive workforces. Excuse me. Hi, my name is Geasia Wilhite and I am 20 years old. I graduated from West Monroe High School. I love the Rebels. Um, I worked at West Monroe High School as uh, an assistant for the principal and for the librarian, and I love working for them. I love to sing, dance, and be around people. Um, I love to go to church and just have fun. Um, my dream job is to always work, you know, for special needs and to be a counselor for them. Um, I work with this company to try to, you know, get a job that that's my that's my dream job. And I hope that I can get my dream job because well that's what I want to do. Take any questions from the audience. They can be spoken out loud or dropped in the chat box. And one of our speakers or representatives from Goodwill or Northeast Delta HSA will be glad to answer. Um, I have a question for Bambi. Hi, Bambi. This is Anita. Hi. 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 Um, the presentations were excellent. This, they, were, they were excellent. So I have a question for you. When you mentioned various universities. Can you hear me? Am I loud enough? Okay. When you mentioned that various universities have begun programs, are already uh, offering those programs for people with disabilities, and Grambling may begin one, could you tell me a little bit more about it? Because I'm quite interested in starting something at the University of Louisiana Monroe. Okay, can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so I would suggest for a university that wanted to start such a program, um, the uh, Louisiana Developmental Disabilities um, Council is funding um, a project with which um, Dr. Gerilyn Beckers at Southeastern is leading. And uh, the contract really is to work with universities who don't have this type of post-secondary um, program and help them to develop it because there's some federal approval, um, as you know, working at a university, you know more about that than than I do. But um, she would be the contact in helping. She she's the one who's helping LSU at Alexandria and um, and Grambling. So what I'll do is I'll just send you an individual email and get you get a little bit more information. I'll just call you and get. I don't want to take up the time over here. So I'll just call you because I have been interested in creating a program for a long time now. Um, as you're aware, um, I do these advocacy conferences every year and I have created a um, disability advocacy network you know, of organizations that are able to help and are willing to help people with disabilities. And having a program at ULM is going to uh, cover a void that we have in Northeast Louisiana, you know, and we really, really need it over here. One of the problems we identified in my conference last year was that we have the services, but we don't have the education. And, you know, Bambi, you and I have discussed a whole lot about that, you know, that we need to make all that is available uh, visible to everyone. You know, it is there, the wheel is there, we don't have to reinvent it. But we have to present all of that information to our community so that people can use that information. There are so many ones that began to explore. There are just so many resources out there in our community. People just don't know about it. 
And, and I'll just um, add on to, to that in regards to the higher education uh, programs. I, my background is in, in education and, and I've always um, supported inclusive education. And um, my son who's 21, be 22 this summer, um, is um, gonna be completing his first year at the UL Lafayette program. And it blows me away of how well that program is done, how much independence it gives to those students, um, their use of peer mentors um, in, within the program is incredible. Um, and just engaging in the entire college experience, even though this year we had COVID. Um, and, and financially, um, he pays tuition just like every other student, every other full-time student there. So they're able to make it work and, and really it's something we should be proud of. So I would love for North Louisiana um, to, to have such a program. Absolutely, and, and I'm going to work on this. Uh, do they have, for example, the ULL program, do they have some kind of a guide or a report, you know, just to tell other universities, you know, how they're making it successful, what they're doing, what kind of a program it is, you know, just, just more information about some of the successful programs. Um, let me look while other people ask questions and I'm gonna, there's a link, I know there's a website and um, I'll put that in the chat. Okay, thanks, thanks. Okay. Oh, what a, what a wonderful day and an afternoon we've had. Um, I really appreciate um, the time of our speakers. Lillian, you are the bonus of today. Thank you for your inspiring words. This is exactly why I get up and come to work every day. Um, it, it drives me, this re-motivates me. It gives me the energy I need. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Lynn Stevens. I am actually the Director of Workforce Development of Goodwill Industries of North Louisiana. And, um, I just, you know, this gives me the juice I need after a kind of a stressful weekend of falling down and having some stitches put in. And it's I'm back to my 110% when I leave here today and, and really makes me um, energized about the future of our state of Louisiana and what we can do personally, professionally, um, culturally. I mean, just it's, it's everything that I want. Uh, Goodwill Industries mission is um, about improving people's lives through the power of work. We do that all across North Louisiana. So we cover all 26 parishes of North Louisiana and we really do it through workforce development programs. So we're not just the retail store that everybody thinks about when you say Goodwill. Um, we do so much more in regards to workforce training and workforce programs. Um, we operate 18 different programs, and so the PI program is one of those. We also do the supported employment program, so we are a vendor. Um, and so we do that about through a lot of different populations. Um, last year, just even through the COVID pandemic, we served over a thousand people. Think about that, a thousand people when most of the state was shut down. We touched the lives of those people and we helped find over 360 jobs for those individuals. So that's almost one in three if you think about it. Um, we specialize in serving the hardest of the hard. We're the ones who get up every day and figure out how we can hold somebody's hand and lead them to a better opportunity because we truly believe everybody wants to go to work or wants a better life. Um, we do it to those that probably others would probably overlook or stigmatize, you know, whether it be a disability, an addiction, somebody who's an older worker, somebody who's maybe never had a job, or those um, basically re-entering for society um, from the prison system. We specialize in those people. Um, you heard earlier some of our speakers talk about the COVID pandemic. You know, it really has changed our, our workforce population. Um, it, things that existed, you know, five, 10 years ago that we thought we would never get to or we would get to someday, well, someday happened for all of us really quickly. And it's really changed the dramatics of how um, workforce exists, what opportunities exist and how we can adapt 
and really work towards a more inclusive workforce, I think. Um, I know right now, currently in Northeast Louisiana, there's about 3,200 open positions. So the opportunity today, if we, there was ever an opportunity where we could create change and really um, in our workforce dy dynamics, now is that time. You know, I came to Goodwill, a lot of people don't know my story and it's hard to tell because of my virtual backdrop, but I came to a Goodwill nearly three years ago now. It's hard to believe it seems like yesterday. And it really was a personal goal of mine to really focus on changing people's lives and especially those with disabilities. Um, you see, I've struggled many years. Um, I am physically disabled. I'm actually in a, a motorized wheelchair and I've struggled over the years. I've had great jobs, but you have to also remember that things change. I have a progressive muscle disease and so um, that will continue to get worse. And being diagnosed, I was told I would really never see the age of 40. And so I knew at that point I had to be different. I had to work three times, four times as hard. I never graduated college, so add that into the cap. Um, I've continued to struggle over the years. But what I will tell you is employers out there do exist. And Goodwill was one of them that I, I was pretty exclusive in my interview questions to them. They interviewed me, but I actually interviewed them at the same time. You know, the last two employers I've worked for, one didn't truly believe I had a disability and the second one didn't want my dog because I have a service dog to come to work with me every day. So there are people out there that really want to work. And what I will tell you is, even though we have to prove ourselves, we're probably one of the most resilient populations out there. Because I think it was Stephanie was, you know, we've learned to adapt over the years. I've learned to adapt. I've had this disease now. They tell me all my life. I didn't realize at the time. So I've learned to adapt over the years. I'm stubborn. I don't like to ask for help, but I do. Um, and so I think being more, being an individual with a disability, we have to also change our um, communications um, with our employers. And I think that's an important piece that we want to also remind folks today is you're interviewing them. Make sure you, they're, you're allowing time for them to interview you as an employer. I hope each of you today have taken something from our great speakers. Um, I think you'll find that being not only resilient, but being um, dedicated is the other thing I will tell you um, that you'll, you'll get from this experience. Um, for any of the employers on this webinar today, if, I hope if you can take from the webinar to let you know, um, if you're in Northeast Louisiana to let one of my PI staff come out and just get to know them, see what opportunities exist in your company, see if there's a way we can adapt a position. If you don't have a position, um, we want to help fill those 3,200 jobs, whether it be through the PI program or a different program. Um, those of you that are advocates on the phone, because everybody else, if you're not an employer, you're an advocate to me, keep talking about this topic. You know, this year has been not only about COVID, but it's really been about social unrest in across the country. But to me, to have that kind of social unrest and talk about diversity and diversity right now, I think is a buzzword. We really need to make sure we do exactly what Stephanie said and have somebody at the table talking about and including those with disabilities. If we're really going to change the conversation about um, diversity and DEI, that's something all of us need to be talking about more of. And now is the time to do that. So I'm gonna close out today. We're gonna finish a little bit early. So you're gonna get, it looks like 30 minutes of your day back to the job. Um, I really appreciate all the time that you um, have given to us today, an hour and a half is, is a time you don't get back. And so for us here at Goodwill, we appreciate you learning with us because I learned something today. I think some of my employees learned something today. Today's 
rock star speakers, Bambi, Stephanie, Lillian, you guys are awesome. Uh, keep, keep up the great hard work. This is hard work. And um, let us continue to fight this mission and fight the strong fight for those with disabilities. Lastly, I wanna just thank HSA for walking alongside with us, trusting us to be your provider, to help those individuals with um, developmental dis disabilities. We trust that you are a great partner and can work with us. And this is a, uh, a fruitful um, partnership that will go for years. I know we've seen some early success and so we appreciate that you've trusted us into that care. And so if there's nothing else, I just, I'll sign off today's um, presentation and I just wanna thank you.